Amen. Let's take our Bibles tonight and open together to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. I want to begin by reading the first nine verses tonight. First Samuel 30, beginning in verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, to Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Basor, where those that were left behind stayed. Tonight I want to preach to you a message entitled, Encourage Yourself in the Lord. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word. And tonight as we come to it once again to look at a chapter that you have inspired and preserved for us so that we might learn from it, so we might live more like Christ by obeying the truth that we find illustrated in it. So Lord, teach us, show us, and change us. And in those times that we are tempted to be discouraged and to despair, may we remember to encourage ourselves in you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, David was no stranger to the ups and downs of life. He endured the pains of great tragedies and he enjoyed the joys of great victories. But especially in the times of trial and hardship, you read his story and you sometimes wonder what in the world kept him going. How did he not just give up and throw in the towel and walk away and say, enough, I, I, I've been trying to do right, trying to serve God my whole life, and it's just been a series of one headache and hardship after another. How did David keep from giving up? It was because David kept his focus on the Lord. In our passage, there is a phrase that is used to summarize David's attitude. In verse number 6, it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. There is a parallel verse to this in the New Testament book of Philippians. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Now this verse about, uh, that talks about David encouraging himself in the Lord was written about David when he was going through a, a very difficult trial. We're not going to go back and, and read all the uh, events leading up to this. So let me just summarize it for you. This was a time in David's life where he was on the run. King Saul was seeking to kill him, and so he was living in exile in a foreign land. 
he'd been rejected by a large number of his foreign neighbors also. And on this particular occasion, there was going to be a battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. David was living amongst the Philistines, and, they, and so he went with the Philistines not to fight the Israelites, but he was at the back, basically as the rear guard, uh, to, uh, to help them out in that way. But because of his previous history, obviously, of killing a whole lot of Philistines, there were a number that were like, uh, we don't want David here with us. Let's just send him back. Uh, we're not exactly thrilled that he's living amongst us anyway, but we certainly don't want him in the battle where he can turn against us. So they made David and his men go back to the city they were staying, which was the city of Ziklag. And so David and his men come to Ziklag three days later, and they find that the city had been attacked. It had been ransacked, in fact, and all of the people had been kidnapped. All of their wives and children had been stolen from them. Well, obviously, they're all very grieved. They're very upset. In verse number 4, it says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever had a situation like that? Where you have been so upset, so hurt, that you cried until you literally couldn't cry anymore? That was the situation that they were in. And for David, it only got worse. It says in verse 6 that he was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. Now, these people who were his, his close followers, I mean, these people were basically living in exile to identify with David and to help him and to try and be an encouragement to him. And now, all of a sudden, they're, they're talking about killing him. Because they were so grieved, verse 6 says. And it's in the midst of, of this horrible circumstance, all this grief and heartache that the Bible says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And what follows in this chapter is a description of what David did to keep himself encouraged in the Lord. You see, this encouraging of himself was not only an internal thing that, you know, David just somehow pulled together enough inward spiritual strength to keep going, but rather what you see is the outworking of, of this attitude of encouraging himself in the Lord. You, fee, you see some specific um, actions that he took that kept him encouraged. First of all, he sought the Lord praying for specific direction for his life. Then he went into action. He pursued the enemy until he overtook them. And then finally he demonstrated kindness and generosity even to people who had never done anything for him and some people who had probably hurt him. And because David encouraged himself in the Lord, God gave him a great victory in this circumstance. He turned, God turned a situation that looked like a defeat into a victory. And I, I hope that as we look at this tonight, that every one of us will remember the lesson that no matter how difficult the circumstances we are going through, we can and we must encourage ourselves in the Lord. And when we do, God will turn defeat into victory if we keep our focus on Him. Number one, I want you to see with me how that in, uh, in order to encourage himself in the Lord, David sought the Lord. David sought the Lord. I draw your attention back to verses 7 and 8. They've been weeping, they've been crying, they're grieved. The people are, are uh, talking about stoning David. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now verse number 7 says that David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, and thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now, we've got to back up a little bit and review our history of the Old Testament tabernacle and the priestly garments in particular. 
When God gave instructions in the Old Testament law for the priestly garments, there was one particular piece called the ephod. E-P-H-O-D. That is a fancy word for a vest. Now, this ephod was worn like a vest over the outer garments, and it was uh, peculiar for a number of reasons. It had jewels on it, it had the names of the tribes on it. But one of the interesting things about this is in the ephod was kept something called the Urim and the Thummim. You're like, Urim and Thummim. Sounds like you're muttering there. No, that's what it was called, the Urim and the Thummim. And you read about this occasionally through the Old Testament. What were the Urim and the Thummim? We don't know exactly what they were, whether they were some kind of special stones or um, some kind of a, maybe a metal plate or something like that, but what it was used for was a method of asking God specific questions and getting specific answers. So the best way I can illustrate this, to use a modern example, is it was essentially like flipping a coin. So one of the common theories behind it is that the ephod contained two rocks. Maybe it was a white rock and a black rock. And so if they needed to ask the Lord a specific question, the high priest was given permission by God to present the question to God, and then he would reach inside the vest, not knowing which stone it was he was feeling, he would pull, pull one out, and whether it was one, the answer was yes, or if it was other, then the answer was no. And so it was a way to get a direct answer, kind of like if you flip a coin, all right? So like we used to say when we were kids, heads I win, tails you lose. That, that's the idea. Uh, but this was a way that they could ask God for specific questions and, and or ask Him specific questions and get specific answers. So that's a very, very quick history of it. But when David called for the priest and the ephod, this was what he was asking for. He needed to ask God a specific question. And the question was, very important, shall I pursue them? David had one of two courses of action. He could sit there and do nothing if that's what God wanted him to do, or he could get out there and chase after this army. Now the problem with chasing after the army was he only had 600 men with him. In the context of Bible time, hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's really not a lot of guys. And so to take that risk, he needed to be especially sure that it was God's direction. The important point for you and I is that David, in his time of distress, when he encouraged himself in the Lord, he sought after the Lord. Now, we do not have the Urim and the Thummim today. We don't, we don't know where it is, if it even exists at all. It may be with the Ark of a Covenant, for all we know. We have no idea where these things are. And I think that's by design. Because God knows the propensity of human nature to be superstitious. And if those items still existed, uh, people would be inclined to worship those items instead of worshiping God. We don't know where the human, Urim and Thummim are. And now, if you Google it, you'll find a whole host of YouTube videos that will tell you where the Urim and the Thummim are. I kid you not, I saw a YouTube video one time. A guy claimed he found the Urim and the Thummim at a Goodwill in Tennessee. I am not joking. It does not exist today. We do not inquire of the Lord the same way. And I would caution you very strongly about making important life's decisions by flipping a coin. Instead, we have been given the promise of prayer. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Many times when we are going through a, a hardship, a trial, we are experiencing grief and pain and heartache, we have a lot of questions. We question why. We question what now. We have a lot of questions that we need answers to. What do we do with those questions? We should take them to the Lord in prayer. Do not be afraid to ask God specific questions. God delights in giving His children specific guidance in times of difficulty. 
Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You know, I, 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 I a lot of times have wished that I had something like the Urim and the Thummim, you know? That would be so easy. God, what do you want me to do? You know, pull it out. Oh, white rock, i got to do this. All right, there we go. Or if God would just, you know, write it in the sky, go do this. Or I've wished that maybe God would just send me a text message. Hey, this is God, do this. But that's not how God operates. Instead, He has a better plan. He answers our prayers in such a way and He orchestrates the events of our lives so carefully so that He can lead us to a position where we have no doubt what His will is for us. And we have no doubt what His answer is to our prayer. And by doing that, He gets even more glory and we are even more blessed. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God wants to hear and wants to answer your prayer? I hope so. David sought the Lord in his time of grief and God answered him. Notice that God told him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God answered him. Because if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. God will hear and God will answer, but we must seek after him. To encourage himself in the Lord, David sought after the Lord. When you are discouraged, seek the Lord. Don't run from Him, run to Him. But let's notice what else David did. To encourage himself in the Lord, number two, David set out to conquer. David set out to conquer. Let's continue our reading at verse number nine. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Basor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind, which were so faint they could not go over the brook Basor. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he, not, he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou, and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me, because three days agone I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. So after having sought the Lord and gotten clear direction from God, the next thing that David did was he set out to conquer. He went after the Amalekites. David did not sit around Ziklag pondering his plight. He didn't sit there and sulk. He got busy. He got up and he did something. But he did not do something just for the sake of activity. He acted with a purpose. You know, there are times where we need to withdraw for a season in order to rest, to heal in body and in spirit. 
That's legitimate. Jesus told His disciples at one point to come apart into a desert place and rest a while. Jesus Himself would often withdraw into, in, to be alone and to spend time with His heavenly Father. So going apart for a while in order to, to heal is one thing. But to stay withdrawn and to just sulk and to mull in our misery is something else. And it's wrong. We must not sulk, but instead we must get busy serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11 commands us, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Sometimes the reason that we spiral into depression, into despair, is because we never get out of that, that mode of just sitting there and thinking about all of our troubles and all of our trials and we just keep going over and over and over it and, and it just ends up driving us crazy and depressing our spirit. We need to get busy serving the Lord. We need to get up and do something for God. David's task here was a very demanding one. He was going to go with his small army of 600 men, which, by the way, he ended up losing a third of those along the way, and he was going to a, attack a very large army, the army of the Amalekites. They came to a brook, the brook Basor, and the Bible tells us that 200 of his men had to stay there because they were so faint they could not go over the brook. They were exhausted. They had left out, marched three days, and marched three days back, and, and now they've got to pursue this, uh, this army. But you know what? God gave them the strength that they needed for victory. Along the way, they, they met this Egyptian slave. And he was able to take them down to where the Amalekites were. And when they found the Amalekites, they were having a big party. They thought that they, they had uh, won the day. And so they were just you know, having a good old time, eating, drinking, dancing, and enjoying all of the spoils of war when David and his 400 mighty men came upon them. And God gave them such a great victory that day that the Bible says that nobody escaped except for 400 young men on camels. And they just ran away. So the amount of men that fled of the Amalekites was equal to the total amount that David had going into the fight, 400. How in the world did he defeat an army with such superior power? Only because God gave him the victory. It was, it was difficult. But David and his men kept on persevering. And because of that, God gave them great victory. You see, we need to find that balance between rest and perseverance. If we are off balance to one side, we're guilty of slothfulness and laziness. If we're off balance to the other side, we are, we're guilty of, of, of just carnality and thinking that we, in our own strength we can accomplish things. We need to find that balance where we are not weary in well-doing knowing that we will reap in due season if we faint not. How do we find that balance? Well, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's by yoking up with Jesus, if you will, that we find the balance between rest and perseverance. We wait upon the Lord, and when we do, he, we shall renew our strength. We have to make sure that we are working but we have to work at the pace that God wants us to work at. I've been reading a book recently entitled The Unhurried Life. And it's been a good reminder to me that we need to be careful that we don't get ahead of God. That we work at God's pace. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the busyness and the drivenness of our culture and not take time for the things that are truly most important, like walking with God every single day. But David got busy. He set out to conquer. God said, pursue after them. So that's what he did. And because of that, he saw a great victory. The Lord blessed him, and he recovered 
everything. The Bible says in verse 19 that David recovered all. And not only that, God gave him even more. On top of that, there was extra spoils that David was blessed with because he encouraged himself in the Lord. Now we see the third thing that David did when he encouraged himself in the Lord. When David encouraged himself in the Lord, he showed generosity. He showed generosity. Look with me now at verse 21. And we'll read through the end of the chapter. The Bible says that David came to the 200 men, which were so faint they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Basor. And they went forth to meet David, to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and the, the men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, You shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as is his part that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. And, then, and when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, to them that were, which were in the south, Ramoth, to them which were in Jatir, to them which were in Aror, to them which were in Sifmoth, to them which were in Eshtimeo, to them which were in Rechal, to them which are in the cities of Jeramelites, and to them which are in the cities of the Kenites, and to them which are in Hormah, and to them which are in Chorashan, and to them which are in Athak, and to them which are in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. It's an interesting close to this chapter because God had given David a great victory. But instead of bragging, instead of gloating, and instead of hoarding all that God had given him, David immediately began to show generosity to others. It began with those 200 men who had stayed behind. They get back from the battle. They get back to the brook. These 200 men come out to meet them. They're rejoicing that God has given victory. And... There were some of the men that had gone with David that said, they're not getting any of this stuff. They didn't come with us to the battle. They don't get any of the spoils. We'll give them their wives and their kids and we'll send them away, but that's it. And you know what David said? He said, uh-uh. That's not what we're going to do. That's not right. These guys would have come if they could, but they were exhausted. And so they, stood by the, they stayed by the stuff. They stayed back here to guard what was left and they did all that they could do and therefore they deserve just as much of a reward for this fight as we do because at the end of it all, notice what David's words were. It was the Lord that had preserved them, that had delivered the company, verse 23, and all of this stuff was not theirs, it was God's that He had given to them. That was David's attitude. And so the first generosity here is he gave an equal portion to the men who stayed by the stuff. And he set a principle, made a law that day. And from then on in Israel, it was a law that whether you went out to battle or whether you stayed home and stayed by the stuff, you would get an equal share in the victory. Did David have to do that? I guess we could argue he didn't have to do that. But David knew it was the right thing to do. And so he showed generosity to these men. And then he went on to give gifts to some of the leaders of Judah. We read through a list of a number of towns that were hard to pronounce. And each of them, there were, there were men that David <clears throat> knew that he sent a present to and, and just wanted to show them kindness. He said, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. 
Did David have to send these gifts? What did these men do for David? Where were they when he was running for Saul? Did any of them stick up for him? Did any of them offer him shelter? We have no record of it if they did. Because at this time he's living as an, in, as in a foreign land, in exile. But yet he showed generosity to them. He didn't hold a grudge. And that's, an, that's another thing that David gave here. Not only did he give physical, material gifts, but most importantly, David gave forgiveness. Go back and look at verse number 6. David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the spoil of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Who were these men that were so grieved? They were the 600 that had gone out with David and come back. The same 600 that left with David to go after the Amalekites and are now coming back. And we don't know if all of them said this, but certainly enough of them spake of stoning David that it was recorded in Scripture as causing him a great distress. And you know what David could have said on the way back from the battle? Every one of you who talked about stoning me, you get nothing. But that's not what he did. He forgave them. He understood the distress they were in. And he forgave them. One of the best ways to encourage yourself is to turn outward and seek to be a blessing to others. When we become consumed with ourselves, it only leads us to greater depression and despair. When we are consumed with us and all we think about is ourselves and how we feel and the injustice that was done to us and our pain and our sorrow, and that's all we think about, we just continue in this ugly downward spiral of greater and greater despair. Instead, we need to turn outward. And we need to seek for opportunities to be a blessing to others. The Bible tells us that one of the reasons God comforts us is so that we can comfort others in their times of distress. One of the best things we can do to encourage ourselves is to demonstrate love for our neighbor by seeking to help and encourage them even though we may be going through a time of great trial and great pain. James 2.8 says, If you fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. I think one of the things that helps us when we're going through a time of trial is to think about others and, and how would you want to be treated if you were them. And then to demonstrate, to act upon that, to show acts of love and kindness and generosity to give of your time, your energy, your resources to someone else. And by the way, don't look for someone who can pay you back. Look for someone who, can, who maybe has no way to repay you, but you can be a blessing to them. Get outside of yourself. Get your mind off of you. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others, Philippians 2 says. When David encouraged himself in the Lord, he showed generosity to those around him. Because David encouraged himself in the Lord, God turned a defeat into a victory. When David encouraged himself in the Lord, he first sought after the Lord. May we do the same in our times of hardship. Seek the Lord in prayer. When you're discouraged, don't run from God, run to Him. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Hebrews 4 invites us to come before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then secondly, He set out to conquer. He didn't sit and sulk. He got busy doing something at the direction of the Lord. Don't act for the sake of acting, but rather act with a purpose. Do something intentional for God. Get busy serving God. And then finally, when David encouraged himself in the Lord, he showed generosity to others. No matter how difficult life may be, 
The fact remains, God has been so good to us. He has given us so much more than we deserve. We have so much to be thankful for, and we have so much that we can share with others. We need to turn our attention away from ourselves so that we might be a blessing to those around us. When we encourage ourselves in the Lord, God will turn something that looks like a defeat into a great victory. With heads bowed and eyes closed this evening. I know that there have been in our church family some times of great discouragement and trial in the past few months. And honestly, this message came out of a, a desire and a prayer request on my part. Lord, how can I be an encouragement to our church family right now? And I really believe that the example that we find in King David in this instant is, is one that we must follow. That we do not allow ourselves to be consumed with grief and despair and so consumed with ourselves and our pain, but rather that we encourage ourselves in the Lord, that we seek Him, that we set out to serve Him, and that we show generosity to others. Whatever you're facing, what you, whatever you have faced, may look like a defeat. But God can turn it into a victory. So encourage yourself in the Lord. Would you stand together with me, heads bowed and eyes closed? My wife is going to play the song, Rejoice in the Lord. And maybe you need to take a moment tonight and pray. about whatever this trial is you're facing, the hardship that's got you down, got you discouraged. Maybe you just need to go to God and encourage yourself in Him right now.